How much money do you make per month from Section 8 real estate? I make a little over a million dollars per month. A little Section 8 rental property. No, no, no. I, I said per month, man. How much do you make in money, American dollars per I'm, month? I make a million dollars per month. A million U.S. dollars? A million nine, nine, eight, U.S. dollars, not pesos, no Canadian rupees, nothing. <laughs> Today, I brought my boy, Tom Cruise. Now, let me tell you about Tom. Tom is a real estate mastermind and not any kind of real estate section eight real estate you know what i'm saying that's another good thing about america we got this safety net you can be a broke boy and, and you'll still you can still stay alive here right where nima's from nima's from man you broke over there man sober i think oh i think they cut your hands off <laughs> behead behead you or some shit <laughs> but in america you can be broke and the american taxpayers will pay for you to have a crib now somebody gotta own those cribs the country don't and that leaves an opportunity for us, the capitalists. If we can own the cribs, America pays us to let a broke boy live there. Then now the poor boy has a crib. America gets to fucking not have its poor riot as much. And we get paid. Everybody wins. That's why I want to bring my man, Tom Cruise. And we want to give you all the definitive guide on how to get into Section 8 real estate. What's up, Tom? Hey, how's it going, man? Thanks for having me. That's hey. the best intro to Section 8 I've ever heard. Hey, man. And listen, thank you. No, that's, I've got a lot of money, guys. <laughs> America <laughs> gives a place for broke boys to live. Yeah, man. The poor boys, man. They can, listen, we're, we're housing America's poor. There we go. You know what I'm saying? And this is cool because Tom has helped me get into Section 8 real estate. I got my first career. We're going to get a poor boy up in there. There we go. You know, but now I get to house the poor in Section 8. Yes, I do. used to. I used to, like when I was younger, I would just have sex with their daughters <laughs> in their, when I when I was young, you know? Uh -huh. Now we give them homes. Progress. See, we come full circle. Anyway, Tom. Yes. How much money do you make per month from Section 8 real estate? I make a little over a million dollars per month. A little? Section 8 rental property. No, no, no. I, I said per month, man. How much do you make in money, American dollars per I'm, month? I make a million dollars per month. A million U.S. dollars? A million, nine, nine, eight, U.S. dollars. Not pesos, <laughs> no Canadian rupees, nothing. <laughs> That's a lot of bread. Yeah. How many un how many units do you have? I have 722 properties across four different states. Four different states. Okay. Correct. 700 and how many? 22. 22. All right. And there's a poor boy in almost all all of them. I would imagine so. Yeah. They have to be at, at or below the poverty line, which I think for an individual in the U.S. is around forty five thousand dollars. Okay. All right. Listen. Five thousand dollars. <laughs> Jesus. Motherfuckers ain't even trying, are they? I can't speculate <laughs> they, on that. Listen, man, if you can't, listen, one thing about America, you know, in New York, they say, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Right. In America, if you can't make it here, you can't make it nowhere. Oh, yeah. Man. You've got so many opportunity here. Bro, I've been to some shit countries. Like, I was in v Venezuela, and I'm riding down their uh, highway. Yeah. And I'm looking, we're going past mountains, and this is fucking miles of, of houses made of fucking aluminum foil oh, and yeah. sticks oh yeah we have like, those in brazil too yeah oh that's right because you're, you're, you're yeah. brazilian yeah. you know what i'm saying yeah. i've seen the movie city of god there you go I'm, very very accurate i know all about it yeah. so like if you live in one of those countries i get it yeah but here damn well the beauty of that is you can still live in a home yeah what i want to do in this video sure is i want to give these guys game you know as much as we can of how to start in section eight so how did you start in section eight real estate yeah so after i graduated from the university of north carolina at wilmington mm -hmm. um i knew that i needed to get cash to be able to invest in real estate and my first way into doing that was i was doing web design and kind of like marketing as a side hustle out of college mm -hmm. um so i started wholesaling properties if you're not what does that mean wholesaling properties is when i find properties that are somewhat distressed i put them under contract right let's say if i find a property for sixty thousand dollars it might be a little run down and it, it could use some improvement or it could be flipped and sold to somebody else mm -hmm. well i didn't have the money to buy the property and flip it mm -hmm. so i bought the property put it under contract and then i would find someone like you that has a high net worth that would be interested in buying it so let's say i, I put it under contract for 60 grand so you didn't buy it. i didn't buy it you put it in the contract. i just put it under contract how much that cost you maybe five hundred dollars fine yeah because okay. right. they're gonna still need some cash as like a um, you know good faith payment good or they call it earnest money so i give them five hundred dollars i put the property under contract and i say hey i'll close in 45 days mm -hmm. So then what I would do is that property might have been listed for 70 grand. I got under contract at 60,000, right? Mm. Or I got a really good deal on it. Yeah. So then I would come to you, Brandon, and say, hey, look, I can get you this property that, that appraised at 70,000. Mm. I'll get it to you for 63,000. Uh, so the numbers make sense for you because you can still flip it and add a bunch of value. And I made the difference between that 60,000 and the 63. So I made three grand, basically a finder's fee. Right, right, right. And putting it under contract guaranteed that I would be able to get that 3K. So you, you profited 2,500 because you put down your five, uh, that five. Well, that goes back towards it. But yes, that 
profit at 3K. Okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's what's yeah. up. How does somebody get into that? Yeah, so there's a couple of different ways of doing it. I started um, through what's called driving for dollars. I would mm -hmm. literally get in my car and drive around their neighborhoods that might be older neighborhoods, starter neighborhoods, places that might just have properties that are like more in disrepair. Mm -hmm. And I mean, every city has, has some. I would drive through, take pictures, mm -hmm. uh, get the address, and then I would go home, put it into a software. It's called um, Deal Machine is the name of the software. Mm -hmm. And um, it would show you all the all the addresses. You could skip trace all the, the homeowner's information. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I would send them like postcards or I would call them or email them and see if they're interested in selling the property. Mm -hmm. That's the first step is finding interested homeowners that have properties that are clearly distressed or abandoned, yeah. putting it under contract at a really good rate, and then going and starting to find a buyer for it. You, you would already have connections with these buyers. So yeah, so the first thing that I did was I started looking for inventory because I knew that if I went and looked for buyers and I didn't have anything to sell them, they weren't gonna take me seriously. Yeah, yeah. So there were a couple of deals where obviously I lost the five hundred dollars because I put the property in the contract. Mm. I you know went out and started looking and I couldn't find anybody in time. Yeah. So but I at least had the deals in hand. You know what I mean? And if you cannot find a buyer, you can cancel a contract. A lot of people think that you're oh, forced really? to buy the house. You're never in any state in the United States forced to buy the house. Uh. You can always back out and cancel a real estate contract. So what I would do is. I would put the property in a contract. Uh -huh. I would go to like a real estate investor association meetup or I'd go to Cars and Coffee. I would go to whatever events had high yeah. net worth individuals. I'd find someone like you. Mm -hmm. I'd bring, you know, some uh, some documents about the deal, some uh, pictures. If I had videos, I would bring that. And I'd say, hey, Brandon, you're sitting in this property. I can wholesale it to you. My assignment fee is 3K. You, that's how much money I would make. Right, right. So then from that point on, it was just a matter of scaling. So then I started doing Facebook ads. Well, we're, we're quick, we're, we're, yeah. we're, how old were you at this time? I was like 25. 25, so you yeah. were really young. Yeah, I was really yeah. young. Okay, yeah, cool. this is in Wilmington, North Carolina. That's where I started. Okay, cool. Yeah. So you so you started doing Facebook ads? So that was my next kind of like step to get more property owners to uh, be interested because going around, driving around is not scalable and it's a huge yeah. waste of time, right? Yeah, yeah. But that was a good idea for a proof of concept to understand yeah, how yeah. to do it. So then what I did after that is, I'm sure you guys have seen those like we buy ugly house billboards or like, yeah. you know, that's what they're doing. They're uh, getting people to say, hey, I have an ugly house. I'll sell it to you for a cash offer, mm. right? So that's what I started to do. I'd say, hey, divorce, death, you know, whatever is going on in your life, yeah. I'll buy your property. And then they started reaching out to me. Hey, Tom, I got this three bedroom in Wilmington. And I mean, I would spend maybe like a thousand dollars a month on Facebook ads mm. and I would get 20, you know, leads. And really? Maybe three of those would close. So then I would have three properties that I would then go to my investor list. And eventually you start buy creating a buyer's list. Uh, I might have like Nima, I might have you, I might have, you know, John and Mark and Adam. Mm. And that, then all I have to do is I find a property, put it under contract. I send one text message to this group. Yeah. And it's like, hey guys, first come, first serve, who wants this property? I'll put the address mm. and I'll put the price. From and that they can't steal it from you because you got it. It's under contract. contract. They can't snake it from you. Yeah. yeah. So you have like 45, 60 days to, to, to lock it up. You know, because Tom recently helped me get my first uh, Section 8 property, but it was one of these guys, a wholesaler, like found it, helped us found it, find a deal, right? Yeah. Yeah, then we talked to the people, we figured it out. So how much money did you need to start actually buying your own properties? Yeah, so then after that, I started doing like seller financing. Seller mm -hmm. financing is when you're buying the property directly from the homeowner uh -huh. and you're making monthly payments to them. Uh -huh. So you can avoid putting 20% down. I was putting like three, four, five thousand dollars down per property when I got started. Wow. Yeah. Because of seller financing. Yes, because I was making the I was making the down payment of let's say five K to the homeowner. Yeah. And then I was making the monthly payments every month to them. Uh so okay. I was, there was no banks. We're doing a, a free training, guys, this um this Monday, right? On we're gonna break down this wholesaling and section eight you know how to get into it so if you want even more information and we go and do it live the link is in the description um so click that link now and check it out but let me just make sure i understand this right you started off with like five hundred dollars and started wholesaling correct and then, until you got some bread and then you got you know your first few yeah, i mean it only yeah. took two or three properties to pick up between i don't know nine and ten thousand dollars uh, ah yeah. okay and then when you got when you got about 10, 10 grand, then I started looking at like real estate. I didn't get into section eight immediately. I started oh, buying really? condos, and then I bought single family properties. And then I realized that it's like too expensive, you know, because mm. at that point you're buying higher end properties. They weren't section eight, so it might have taken you know seven, ten, twelve thousand dollars even with seller financing on a hundred and fifty thousand dollar property. Yeah. So I was like, well, let me just try a fifty five thousand dollar property. Uh, That's when I eventually learned about section eight when I started going really like 
and on you, the low end because i remember you told me you kind of stumbled into this right yeah ball. total total accident it's one of the first properties that i bought for fifty five thousand dollars. it was rented for 1350 dollars per month mm. and uh, the day after i closed on the property is when the homeowner reached out to me and said hey uh we need to switch you over to you know section eight direct deposit and we need to get you on their inspection schedule so you can start getting paid mm. so at that point i had no idea about section eight like i've never done yeah. a section eight deal in my life um i think he purposely didn't tell me that it was section eight you know because he thought that it might scare me away uh, but um i mean the cash flow was so good that I really wouldn't have cared. I would have figured it out either way. So after you found that out, yeah. you you said you're going to only focus on Section 8. Yeah. At that point, I might have already had think, maybe 15 properties. Oh, so, really? Yeah, yeah. I already had condos and single families. Mm. So yeah, at that point, any leases that expired on my first 15 properties, I was replacing them with very quickly with Section 8. How old are you at this point in this part? Of um, 20, probably around 27. 27. Yeah, okay. yeah. So you've been doing this for two years. Yeah, I've been yeah I've been wholesaling for probably a year and a half, okay. and then figuring stuff out. I was doing a lot of trial and error, man. Right, because there was no one yeah. teaching it the way you teach it now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay. So you went all in the social the Section Eight after this first one. Right? Correct. What were the main advantages to Section Eight versus traditional real estate? Investment? It was just the arbitrage opportunity. So when I realized that Section Eight does not care about the value of the house, they only care about the bedroom count and the location. Mm. That's when the light bulb moment hit. Mm. I can buy a sixty thousand dollar property and rent it out for fourteen hundred dollars. Is insane because mm. if I bought a sixty thousand dollar property right now and try to rent it to you, yeah. you wouldn't give me more than eight hundred dollars for it. You know? right, right. So the fact is, Section Eight has to incentivize their investors to actually accept Section Eight, so their tenants can you know find housing. Because if they make the rent eight hundred dollars, no Section Eight investor is going to accept Section Eight. Mm-hmm. So they have to make it more expensive. Right. It's just basically they have to compete with the market. They have to compete with the market. Yeah. And if they don't, then what you have is all these Section 8 tenants, or as you call them, broke boys. Yeah. They can't um, find housing. And that's uh, a huge problem for Section 8 because then you have all these outstanding vouchers. Mm-hmm. And it looks really bad for the county because it's administered oh. on a county level. So think about if you're a county and you have 5,000 outstanding vouchers and no one can find housing. Mm-hmm. Well, that means that the budget's not being used up. And uh-huh. that, that looks bad for them because in the following year, following fiscal year, the federal government goes back. HUD says, hey, New Hanover County, you still have 5,000 outstanding vouchers. You know why? Uh, and, they, and they collected tax money on it. Yeah, that's so it. Like now it's like the, everybody's like, yo, man, where's this money going? Yeah, yeah. Basically. So, and then they'll actually readjust their budget and lower it. Because they're like, oh, oh, last year you didn't use all this budget, so we're going to, so. And they want to keep the budget it's a, high. Yeah, they want the budget high. Mm-hmm. So they can keep, you know, those coming in. And then they also, of course, get the property taxes paid on those properties that have uh-huh. something. Uh-huh. So okay. It's a vicious cycle and they can't get out of it. They can't get out beautiful of it. Beautiful part. So that's the beautiful part. And then, yeah. Yeah. One, the rent is guaranteed every month by the government. It's guaranteed, yeah. So yeah. the majority of the rent is uh, paid for. It all depends on the tenant. Mm. So the worse off they are financially, the better it is for you. Nah. If they're disabled, even better. Mm. If they're elderly on Social Security fixed income, perfect. Right. Single mom with multiple dependents and like a part-time job, I mean, that's that's money. Really? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So the, I, so the ideal the ideal Section 8 tenant is a single mom. Single mom. Maybe five, six kids. Yeah, three or four is Three ideal. or four yeah. kids. Because then they can fit into a four bedroom. Four uh, bedrooms like the max that Section Eight will, for the most part, pay. And she's crippled. Yes, or on dis- disability. Disa- yeah, disabled on some yeah, level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dis- yeah. Okay, just mental disability. Yeah, that counts. That's, really? that's probably the best, actually. That's probably the best. It's yeah. just like crazy. <laughs> yeah, my fault. I'm sorry. Yeah. Mentally disabled. Yeah, those are really good. And then also the elderly, <laughs> 74 to 76 years old on fixed income. Because then they have uh, it's a lot less wear and tear on the property. Yeah, they you have like party ten to twelve years shelf life on them. Yeah. It's really good. A ten years. Who was that last part? Uh, <laughs> on average, they'll live another ten to twelve years. Yeah. So that's about how much you can, rent you can get out of them. Oh, before so you, they expire. Before, before it's a, it's, a, it's that's where right. they go. You know, what I'm saying, see them at the crossroads. There you go. You know. Yeah. And then you get another. Then you get from someone from their immediate family probably come in there all section eight. There's a lot of multi generational vouchers. Yeah. So that happens actually quite a bit. Like a grandparent will die, and um, they'll the voucher like their descendants will have a voucher as well. Oh. Yeah. Especially if they're living there. They with don't them. inherit it. They just never came up yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll go and apply for the voucher and if they already have a family member on it, it's a lot easier for them to get into it really why yeah i don't know i think they just see it as like a legacy i, I <laughs> <laughs> yo that's something to, you know plus they know that they know the ins and outs i remember i think when, that's part of it there too. was a point where i was back when i was struggling in new york and I, my boy uh my boy's mom she had been on food stamps probably her whole life yeah and she's like 
man, you need to get some food stamps. Yeah. And she took me to the offices. She was talking to the people on my behalf. She knew what to say. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She knew the shit. Like, she, and I came out with she the, the big EVT card, yeah. you know? And I was like, oh, shit, all right. Yeah. <laughs> and like the same day, but it's it was basically the same thing. So it's, she knew, they know the ins and outs. Correct. When it's generated. And when they turn 18, then they can apply for those, vouch for those like benefits. So that also helps too. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, 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 okay. So guaranteed income. Correct. And they usually stay for a long time. Long right? time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're not moving for careers. They're not moving for jobs. They're not, <laughs> not moving, moving for jobs. They're not moving for education. <laughs> they stay there for a long time. I mean, it's true. Not, none of them are leaving for college. Yeah. It's just a reality of it. So, and that's the biggest expense when you have a rental property is a turnover. Is that like a tenant moves out? You got to clean the carpets. You got to, you know, cut the lawn. You got to do all the stuff to get it ready. And there'll be months, maybe a month or two that you don't. Yeah, have I would say an average is about three to five weeks to okay. turn a unit. It just depends on how they leave it. Yeah. And of course, they pay a security deposit. They pay first and last month's rent. Mm. So you have a few thousand dollars to offset, you know, any wear and tear. Yeah. But it doesn't matter if they're there for seven years, dude. Yeah. And you know they've paid the house over twice you know it doesn't really matter if they leave three or four thousand dollars worth of repairs because they'll be there they'll pay for the whole mortgage yeah, yeah. and they also want that deposit back because it's a huge oh, yeah. you know, stepping stone to their next property uh, so generally section if you screen them correctly and you don't put you know shitty tenants in there yeah you'll be gucci how do you do that how do you how do you because i guess so when I, when I when I was telling some people, man, I'm about to get in Section Eight, man, they was like, "Yo, you gonna have dope, yeah, yeah, you gonna have the dope dealers. It's gonna be a trap house." Up yeah, there. yeah. How do you stop that from happening? So all you have to do is just not be a shitty investor, right? Okay. And that comes down to making sure that they don't have evictions, making sure they're not convicted felons, making sure that they're not on any sex offender list, mm -hmm. making sure they don't use an Android device. Like we don't allow whoa, any whoa, Android. Tell, tell me about more about that. We don't allow any Android <laughs> device users in our portfolio starting last year in November. <laughs> we just noticed that the majority of them were getting evicted. Yeah. All the evictions that we had. If it gets to an eviction, it's really bad. Because I mean, yeah. we give them every opportunity because we don't want we don't want a vacancy. In, in New York, you you, you you can be like thirty days. Yeah. Eight, well, we we only days. buy in landlord friendly states, so we can get them out in a month for yeah. two hundred dollars, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like in North Carolina, it's very easy. Mm -hmm. So we realized that like none of our iPhone users were getting evicted, and we had a lot of them. Yeah. So we're like, you know what? Let's just cut out Android altogether. Yeah, no. Doesn't matter if they have a Note two or Galaxy S twenty four. Doesn't matter what it was. Yeah. We cut them out. Well, that makes a lot like of sense because there's there's more Android than just you know, a Samsung Note. Most board. Android devices are like cheap, shitty, yeah, like trap. $29 phones. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah Burner yeah. phones or like Walmart phones. So we just didn't want it. So we, so now it's like the sense. iPhone. That makes yeah. a lot of sense, man. And a lot of criminals, like real, real shit, get Android because yeah, yeah. they can dispose. dispose. Yeah. So it just, it, I mean, it's super easy to see if they have a green bubble, we just instant disqualification. <laughs> is there any legal ramifications? Like, them it's not a protected class. You know, oh, it's not like, this is not a protected no, class. Device, device type is not a protected class. Um, And even then, like, like if they did decide that they were going to say some discrimination, okay, sorry, we had someone else come ahead of you. I mean, there's a million things that you yeah, can do. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. That, that's you had tough. something on your credit. So you just, you just screen them, right? Screen them, and, yeah, and, and really aggressively. Tell me how, since you implemented the Android, we haven't, uh, had, barricade, we haven't had an eviction since November. You haven't had it? Zero. Zero eviction. Zero eviction. So it's working. The on system some, is working. On some level, yeah. They may not get the causation, it's not correlation, blah, blah, blah. We just realized that the iPhone users have better credit yeah. as a whole. And this is like thousands of tenants. I've been doing this for eight years. So we yeah. can go back and look at a lot of empirical data. This is not some like anecdotal, like, hey, yeah. I just thought it'd be funny to say that. But we legitimately do not allow Android device users in our port in our properties. Wow. Yeah. Hey man, so if you, so if you got the note, listen, <laughs> man, you shouldn't have paid all that extra money for a note, man. You should you have go. got this, your, your your money right. Said your funny right. All right. Um, how much does someone need to get into this? I guess they can start with just five hundred dollars if they. Know yeah, if you start wholesaling properties, I think five hundred to a thousand dollars is completely feasible. No okay. buy, you know, put your pro first property in their contract, and then go ahead and start building a buyer's list. Yeah. And then to buying Section Eight, I would say anywhere from you know five to ten k is mm -hmm. a good starting point. How many of your students start off like wholesaling? and then move on to section eight like yet yeah. most of the people that come to me already have like a few grand you know, some th yeah and they want to get right into section eight right mm -hmm. so if you have like zero dollars or like less than a thousand it's you can't start section eight investing because you're gonna yeah. need you know three five seven thousand dollars for a down payment right you're gonna have to be able to get into the game but um if you do need to then yeah wholesaling's an opportunity right okay so you can it just takes time it takes very little money yeah and you teach uh both of them right yes Okay. So yeah, I teach wholesaling and also Section Eight. Guys, make sure you click the link in the description. Join that um that free training we're doing because you're gonna learn about the wholesaling. Yeah. 
and you can learn about uh, Section 8 simultaneously. It's me this Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern yep. time. Yep, you're yeah. right. That's right. That's right. Okay, you said seven to eight grand for a down payment? Tell yeah, so about. no, that's all inclusive. So okay. you can expect between 2500 to maybe 5000 for a down payment. How, how are you doing? Oh, because Yeah, with seller finance. That, yeah, okay. And then, of course, you're going to need a couple thousand dollars just to get the property ready for Section mm-hmm. 8. So you're going to have to maybe do like power washing. You're going to have to yeah. do maybe like paint. There's always going to be some minor repairs. Mm-hmm. So I always like to say in that range. Can you do this anywhere? You can. I mean, Section 8 is a federal program. So yeah. it, it's, it applies to every single state. But obviously, there's some states that are better than others, right? You don't want to do it in California or New York because they have really high property taxes. The properties are expensive. They have terrible landlord laws. You know, there's just a million reasons why you wouldn't want to ever yeah. invest there. So in, like in the Southeast and the Midwest, it just works a lot better. So a lot more property. you live in Florida, how do you how do you manage that? So I have property managers in the states that I buy in. Got so it. like in North Carolina, where I started, mm-hmm. I still have multiple property managers there. Uh, so you can so you can be anywhere and still oh yeah, op- and still buy in the in the yeah. Because if I like a property, I'll just go get a home inspection on the property, yeah. or I'll have my property manager go look at it. Yeah, as real estate agent yeah. or yeah. home inspection. I mean, there's a million different ways to look at a property without you having to be there touching it. When I when I bought my first section eight property, you know, I, I was I was in your home. Yeah. I just saw pictures. <laughs> yeah. We saw some pictures and then somebody else went and did the stuff yeah. that all somebody else is like getting it ready for me. Yeah. It needed some it needs some work, you know, we putting some work into it. But I was able to only I only put down two like thousand two thousand yep. dollars, man. Seller finance. Got a property. And then now I, I put another seven down I got to, to uh, do all this shit, dude. Get it ready. Needs, ready. Yeah. But we should be ready to throw a poor boy up in there. <laughs> you know? Now how how do we manage the properties? Because I'm Yeah, I'm so we already we already have a property this. manager there. So they're gonna to go ahead take the keys and start marketing it yeah and yeah. then we don't and then it's pretty hands-off at that point yeah yeah at that point they're going to be handling once a tenant's off in the property and they have a signed lease and you already start getting uh, section 8 deposits yeah there's really nothing else you have to do nothing else you have yeah. to do if they have a problem they're going to call the property manager they're going to have a handyman go and resolve the issue and then they might like you have a security deposit let's say 1300 dollars. Mm. the repairs will come out of that uh, and there's some other ways to mitigate so you're not going to pay for roofs or any major expenses mm-hmm. we can mitigate that as well yeah yeah so listen guys you, you want to definitely join this training we're doing on monday if you want to learn more about this or learn more about wholesaling, man. Right. You know, it's funny. When I first heard about wholesaling, I was about to hire the salesperson. Yeah. Right. One of my interview questions was, man, if you if you didn't need money, but you had to work, what would you do? Yeah. Didn't have a good answer for me. <laughs> right. But he, he answered everything else where I was going to hire him. Then he came back and I, went, and I offered him the position. He's like, man, man, I thought about what you said. That question. I want to wholesale real estate. I'm like, what? Yeah. It's very <laughs> random. Yeah, yeah. It was like random. But I was like, yo, what is wholesaling real estate? And um, he's doing it. He's successful. You know, I, I think that's when I talked to him. He had bought some properties, not Section 8 yet, because I don't think he knew about it. Okay. But, I'm, you know, we're going to put him on. We're going to yeah, put him on. Yeah. 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 But yeah. he's just been out here flipping because he was good at sales. So maybe it was easy for him to convince people. I don't know. I mean, it is mm-hmm. a, basically a sales job. Yeah. So you have to sell them on, you know, getting the property to you. Yeah, so that's yeah. all he did, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Makes <laughs> that, sense. That's when I found out it was real. So they're going to learn about wholesaling and they're going to learn about Section 8 real estate. Correct. Um, what else should they know um, before we leave? Because I know you got you got to get about here. So. Um, I mean, I would say that's the biggest thing is if you have the cash and you want to start deploying that to build passive income through Section 8, I think it's one of the most like bulletproof strategies. There's Bro. no other real estate strategy or really any investment strategy they can get into where the income is guaranteed by the full faith and trust of the U.S. government. Yeah. I mean, they're going to be paying you every single month. Yeah. You can't get rid of it. There's 7 million Americans that depend on Section 8. Wow. The last thing you want is 7 million broke boys running around the U.S. without a house. <laughs> yeah. So no sitting U.S. president's going to sunset that program. So, and they just keep, you know, bringing more and more onto it. Yeah, yeah. And then, like, you got the migrants coming through. There you go. They, probably, they all need housing. They don't need a place to stay. There you go. You know what I'm saying? And we house everybody. Yeah, America. <laughs> America. Yo, Tom, thank you so much, man. Yeah, no problem. Listen, yeah. guys, make sure you guys sign up for the free training we're doing this Monday at 8 p.m. So you can learn. It's the first link in the description. Learn how to buy back the block with me and Tom. But we both going to be on there. Yeah. We're going to walk you through how I put together my. And Tom, you know, he's got, he makes over a million dollars a month off this shit. So you don't want to miss out. All right. Peace. Peace.